Well, let me welcome you, first of all, very warmly to our worship of God here this morning at Gilcomson Church. Lovely to have you all with us and lovely to welcome those of you here for the first time. We're delighted to have you with us and we hope that uh, you've already received a warm welcome as you arrived and we'll continue to know that uh, warmth of welcome from the living God himself. We gather to worship God and it's uh, a privilege always and a pleasure to join in bringing our praise together to him and knowing his presence among us. Uh, as always, we're glad to welcome those of you joining us online as well. Uh, we, we don't uh, ignore the fact that you're there, and uh, we're delighted that you're able to share with us in this way, and we hope that it will be a source of encouragement, comfort, and blessing to you as well as you join with us. So a warm welcome to you as well. Just a reminder this evening, our evening service at half past six, but we will be open here from uh, five o'clock. Uh, hot chocolate will be on the go uh, with the parade going down Union Street. Um, a, a great opportunity not just to uh, see the lights going on block by block by block, but a uh, chance to chat with folk as well on the street and to welcome them in. So uh, if you're around from five o'clock, um, do just uh, make a point of being here. There will be obviously the traffic uh, restrictions. Uh, take note of that. Uh, I think Union Street itself is shut from five to seven, uh, but there are other uh, sometimes slightly devious ways of getting around those restrictions, but um, you want to find out about them, come and chat to me afterwards. I better not go public on them. We uh, joined together to worship God. We were uh, reading last night at the prayer meeting, Psalm 80, uh, where the psalmist speaks about the Lord as the shepherd of Israel, the one who is enthroned between the cherubim and three times over. The cry of the psalmist is, restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And it is in that confidence of a God who, who delights to make himself known, delights to shine upon his people and to bring his saving grace and power into our experience. It is to him that we bring our worship. Let us join then to worship God in the words of the psalm, O thou my soul, Bless God the Lord. have a seat. Let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us pray. Living God, how good it is always to be able to gather like this and to unite our voices and our hearts in the praise of your own great name and be reminded again from the very outset of the 
fundamental realities about the world in which we live, that you are indeed the maker of heaven and earth, that you're the God who made this world, you're the God who runs this world, you're the God who loves this world, you're the God who has come to this world. And you remind us, even as we gather here this morning, you remind us of that great kindness and grace that you have shown towards us in the person of your Son, all that you have done for us, all that you have secured for us, that enables us to know that no matter how stained and tainted our lives may be by the bad choices that we've made, the bad things that we've done, the bad things that we've said, the bad attitudes that we've adopted, no matter how tainted we may be, you're able through the grace of your son Jesus by the life that he lived of perfect obedience, the death that he died in our place of utter God forsaken us now, risen from the dead, alive and at work in the world, his work completed, you're able to bring forgiveness and give to us a new start and how much uh, some of us certainly need that new start day by day to have the slate wiped clean, to know that there is now nothing that stands against us for the sake of your son, and to find that not only do you wipe the slate clean and give us a new start, but you come by the power of your Holy Spirit to make us new people as well, to empower us and to embolden us and to ennoble us for the living of lives in the power of your Spirit for the praise of your glory. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that in and through your Son, what you've accomplished ensures for all who trust in your risen Son of the Lord Jesus Christ that there will be that resurrection at the last from the dead. You've demonstrated your capacity to do that when you raised Jesus from the dead. You've given us that guarantee and promise that that's what you're committed to doing, and we rejoice in that great soaring hope and look forward, living God, to the day when we don't simply gather here as a, a small crowd of believing people, but gather with our vast multitude from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and gather together in the presence of your risen Son before that throne at the very heart of the universe and ascribe to you together that lasting praise, delighting in the knowledge that we share life for eternity with the great Creator God who is always doing wonderfully new things. And so we come to you, gracious God, in the name of your Son, offering to you our praise and our worship again this morning, and asking simply, please, would you come by your Holy Spirit, and would you meet with us? Would you come and restore us, living God? Some of us really need that being restored physically and emotionally and morally and spiritually. Would you come and restore us? Would you cause your face to shine upon us? Would you come, living God, and save us, rescue us, meet us in our need, and minister to us this day. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. When we turn to the Bible, to God's Word, and we see the Bible as being God's Word, once spoken and continuing through that to speak, and Esther is going to come and read the Scripture passage for us now. The reading this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, the first eight verses. If you have a church Bible, it's on page 756. Jeremiah chapter 2. Starting at verse 1. Israel forsakes God. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. I remember the devotion of your youth. How, as a bride, you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, all you clans of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? 
I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who dealt with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Amen. Great. Uh, thank you, Esther. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later in our worship. But uh, I thought, girls and boys, before you head off to Sunday school, we'd have a, a little think about what uh, Jeremiah, the prophet there, was on about. That's a kind of logo. All right. You know what a logo is? Your school, hands up, your school has a logo. Yep, your school is a logo. Um, it tells you, or it's meant to tell you just a little bit about the school um, uh, to let you know the sort of thing that, uh, that they're on about and so on. Uh, that's a logo that a lot of churches have. And uh, who can tell me what the writing underneath it says? You know, say, you know what the writing underneath it says? We'll put it up on the screen for you. It says, Nec Tamen Consume Bata which is not a language that most of you probably speak. I don't know what language it is. I'd like to guess what language it is. Yep. Latin. That's always a pretty good guess for logos and for mottos and schools, especially uh, as long as the, the school you know, didn't exist from just yesterday. But quite a lot of schools would have a, a motto that's in Latin, uh, which is not a language that people speak now. And therefore, it's probably helpful if you have an idea what it actually means. And we'll put up the meaning of it now on the screen for you. Next time in Consumer Mara means, but it was not burned up. Okay, and that's talking about the picture there, and it's reminding you of a story. We'll bring up an next picture for you, a story in the Bible, quite a famous story, um, uh, uh, where there was a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't burned up. Normally, if you, you kind of light a fire and burn a bush before very long, there isn't much of the bush left. It's, it's been burned up, it's been consumed, doesn't exist any longer, but this bush... This bush just kept on burning and burning and burning and burning. And the, the fire didn't consume the bush at all. Anyone remember what the name of the man in the picture there was? The man who saw the burning bush. Some of you, you girls and boys, you've done this in Sunday school. You should know, I think. Is that not right, Sam and Katie? Yep, you have done it. Anyone remember what the guy's name was? I'll give you a clue. It begins with the letter M. Moses, absolutely right. Remember Moses, and he was out in the desert, and he, he was just gobsmacked because he saw this bush that was on fire and, and yet wasn't being burned up. And it was God's way of reminding Moses of who he is, that he is the God who's just there forever and ever and ever. He never gets tired, never grows weary, doesn't uh, cease to exist. He just is there, and he is like a fire. And the reason why uh, he, he wants us to understand he's like a fire is because he has a heart that is full of love for us. And that love, the Bible says, is a love that never goes out. So we'll put that on the screen for you as well. The, the idea of the fire of God is, is the fire of God's love. It's a, a good love and a pure love and it's a perfect love. And it's a love that just goes on and on and on and on and on. And God never, ever gets tired in his love for it. Doesn't matter what we do, doesn't matter where we go, it doesn't matter who we are, uh, there's nothing that makes God kind of pack it in and say, listen, you know, I'm fed up, I've had enough. Uh, God's love just goes on and on and on and on. And what Jeremiah is on about in this passage is that that God who loves us like that means that we should learn to love him like that as well. He loves us, that God who made everything, that God who runs everything, that God who has come to us in Jesus, he loves us with a love that, that never, ever tires, and he wants us to learn how to love him like that. So we, we don't just kind of love him now and then, uh, but we, we learn to love him and keep on loving him and grow on loving him more and more. And that really is what uh, those verses in Jeremiah chapter 2 are about. We're going to come back a, a, a little bit later on in our service here and have a look more closely at them. But uh, that's our starting point. I want you to remember that God wants you to learn to love Jesus and learn to follow him and keep on loving him more and more. And so I thought we would sing a song that reminds us of the love that God has for us 
and the life that he's given to us and the way in which he means us to enjoy that love that he has for us in Jesus. For God so loved the world. Sunday school now. Now, I welcomed you uh, all at the outset of our worship, but uh, it's a particular pleasure to welcome very specially uh, Freddie Martin here, um, along with uh, uh, some of his colleagues, a student from Delhi, and also uh, Richard, who is treasurer of the Friends of Asher GB. Uh, Freddie and Kira Martin out in India, in Delhi in particular, have been serving there. Freddie was telling us 35 years they've been involved in this work, uh, a wonderful work. We pray for them uh, week by week, and it's been a thrill for us to see the way in which that work has expanded, uh, to see the ways in which in God's providence uh, we've been able um, in uh, uh, some remarkable ways to, to actually have that physical contact uh, out in Australia uh, with them, but uh, um, Freddie's going to come and share just a little bit about the work of Asher, and I hope that you will be suitably enthused. We're delighted to have you, Freddie, and uh, come up and do share with us now. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me once again here. I am back in this church after nearly, I would say, 23 or 24 years. That was a long, long time ago. Um, Asha began in 1988 in response to a cholera epidemic. We are now 35 years in service and helping the poor in the slums of New Delhi. We work in 95 slums and we cover a population of 750,000 slum dwellers. And Kiran is a, was a pediatrician and she began this work when there was a cholera epidemic. And I didn't know what we were getting into, but it's been a wonderful journey. It's been wonderful because God has taught us to live our God-given identity, and that is to live generously and to live graciously. And that is exactly what we try to do every day in our ministry, and we teach our friends and everyone we meet, live generously and live graciously. Next, please. This is, this, yeah, this is how Delhi looks. 32 million people, very posh city, next. And some of the sidewalks in the city of Delhi really spruced up for G20. And Delhi is really beautiful. You can hear the honking of sounds and horns and everything goes on together simultaneously. And life's a real buzz. Next, please. But at the same time, about three million people live in shanty colonies, having no access to clean drinking water. This is one of the tankers that comes 
into the place where one of our student, Loknathan, is traveling with me in Kusumpur Party once in 15 days to give them clean drinking water. Next, please. And they live beside the railway track. No man's land, 50 meters on either side of the track. No sanitation facilities, no toilets. And their houses partially of bricks, sometimes of plastic. If you can just imagine how difficult life could be for them. Next. But one Kiran started her work and she went into the slum colonies in 1988, sitting under a tree. She realized the only way she can do something lasting is, is to provide a healthcare program for the slum communities. And she could do it through women because the men were ruling the roost there. They were like the mafia. They wouldn't let anyone enter and do anything. You had to grease their palms, you had to pay them, you had to literally worship them, and then they would allow you to get into the slums. But she said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to work through the women. So she started a comprehensive healthcare program, bringing in healthcare right at the doorsteps of the slum community. She trained up community health volunteers over a period of few years and made those, these women so able and so confident in themselves that when they went like this in the slum community with their white boxes and started giving those little pills and medicines to help the people, those who were sick, they got better. And things began to change. And the cycle of control over their lives began to be, the chains began to break. And we began to see great things happening in our community. And this is one of the shots, earlier shots, and even just a few months ago. And this is how it looks like even now in the slums where our people go and provide healthcare services. Next, please. Antenatal visits, postnatal visits, children being born in the slums, children being taken, moms being taken to the hospitals. In the earlier days when we were working, our IMR was over 95. Our infant mortality rate now is 13. And there are no deaths of, amongst uh, moms, and none of the moms die, and they're doing very, very well, and they have a healthy life. Next, please. Healthy baby children coming to our clinics now, where we have a three-tier system. One is right into the slums, and one is where we have centers. We have 14 centers where they're able to come and access medical care. And if it is there is a complication or if there is a problem, then they come to our main polyclinic, which is the third tier of a comprehensive health care program that we run in the slums. And we also were able to integrate with many of the hospitals. Kiran being a doctor, she had many, many friends. So we would get our friends home. And all these doctors used to come. We used to have a lovely time of eating and drinking and making merry. And then she would stand up and say, listen, guys, you had a good time, but I want you to help me. And they would say, what? What do you want us to help for? I want you to be referral doctors. So many of them came on our board. And they would be, we would refer our patients to them. And they would give them free healthcare services. It's not cheap in India. It's extremely expensive. You can go to the government hospital, but you'll have to stand there in a big line. It's very difficult. But we were able to provide them one of the best healthcare services today if they avail of us in the slums. Next, please. There you go. Vitamin D given to the children. Next, please. And this is our uh, tertiary healthcare where we have a polyclinic. Next. Earlier days, there was no electricity. They used to tap electricity from the wires. So Kiran also began to work with the women. And slowly, slowly, these women became powerful force in the community. Today, we have 13 registered charities in the slums, having the same legal status as we have. But they're all run by women. They're all run by women. And today they lobby with the government officials, they lobby with the members of the Legislative Assembly. Earlier shots, 2005, 2004, this shot could be, where they were having no electricity, but now we're able to get metered electricity in their homes. Next, please. Garbage disposal areas. Previously, we used to have mountains and mountains of garbage in, in, in our slums. But now the women have been able to meet the members of the legislative assembly and ask them to build this kind of areas where they are decomposed and they are shredded and plastic and other stuff, biodegradable, everything is separated out now 
and things are better in some of our communities. Next, please. Taking, pushing the pedal forward, that's the scene during COVID. As we worked with women, we also continue to work with children. We ran a program 614, and we made it 621, and now I think it's gonna be 630 because we're still dealing with them. And these kids who were born with, before us and who grew up, went to school, we found something beautiful happening amongst them as we spent a lot of time uh, with these children. And we found during COVID, about 300 uh, volunteers came forward wanting to help Asha. Some of our staff had pulled back because they were really scared during the Delta wave. But our children, 300 of them, were helping us like this in, during COVID time. Next, please. Going about from community to community, post-COVID situations in, in Asha, where many people had left to their villages, but the elderly folks were left behind. We found our children taking care of them and looking after them. Next, please. And we meet like this in our home, or we have wonderful sessions with them. Out of the 375 are still volunteering with us, and out of the 75, we have taken 26 of them as uh, our interns, and they are on, on, on a salary with us. Loknath, you're also an intern with us. He's traveling with me, comes from Kusumpur Party, a student graduate, and uh, was a great corona warrior in the slum community during those days. And these kids are now, we are investing our life in them, helping them, helping them to go forward. Next, please. And they are paying it forward. What they learned from us, they are giving it back. Asha today covers a population of 750,000 people. We are in 95 areas. We have 14 centers. How much can we reach out? But these are, these children, these kids, they, they pay it forward. They're, run the classes, they take computer classes, they take English classes, they are always interacting with the community and telling them what has happened to them and how the community can be blessed and make it forward. Next, please. These are some of the uh, internet labs that we have. We have five of them where children come after school, study, boys and girls do their college education here. And during COVID time, this was a primary center for many of them to complete their classes via Zoom, next. We also have a mentorship program. This is the British High Commissioner, present British High Commissioner, and uh, Sonny was with him for many, many uh, months, and he used to teach Sonny, and at last Sonny got, cleared his exams. Richard was one of his teachers. His son was one of his IELTS teacher. Sonny was supposed to travel with me last year, but he made a mistake in his visa. He didn't get a visa, but he's now in Australia doing his master's in political science, and. Uh, is grateful for the mentorship program that Asha runs. Next, please. A variety of places we have mentorship program running in corporate houses and people getting an opportunity to go into these places, learn and experience the joy of mixing and you know learning something new and they pick up so well. Next. 2008, Kiran had a dream and she saw something. And those were the days when we were applying for our children's higher education. And she felt as if God was saying to her, you're so careful about your own kid, but what about the children in the slums? And she saw something, and she got up the next day, so where are you going? She said, I'm going to, I'm going, I'm going to Kalkaji, I'll come and tell you. And she goes to Kalkaji, and she meets a girl in the lane, she knew this was the place that she had seen. And she talks to this girl and says, Shabnam, what are you, what are you doing? She said, just quiet, not saying any much. Kiran said, would you like to go to college? She said, no. She said, did you fail? She said, no. Did you pass? Yes. How many did you score? 92%. Kiran said, 92%? What if I send you to college, will you go? She said, yes, I'll go. And she was the first girl child who went. That year in 2008, we celebrated wide in the city and 28 children went into college. And from 2008 to now, God has been so good to us. We have put 4,500 kids into university. Then came an opportunity for her when she was in, in Australia. The board of Australia asked her, tell us what you want us to do for you. She said, I want my children to have an opportunity to study in Australia. So they said, oh, that's a big tall one. 
So we'll try, we'll try our level best. But God opened up the way for us. And today we got eight kids who have gone through that system. Two are doing their doctorate. One is presently in Melbourne doing his doctorate in typology, mathematics. Tushar Joshi will be going in January. He did his master's in Sydney. Now he's going to Melbourne to do his doctorate in political science, history. Then we have Mohini. She's the one of the first, the first girl. It was a big risk that we took, big risk, but it worked. And she's doing well. And she wears her Asha t-shirt and she's walking in the stores and purchasing. And she meets one of your members of this church who was a member of this church 40 years ago. And that girl lady looks at her, she says, oh, Asha, you're from Asha, India. She said, yes. So she called them over and another student and they, have, they talk to the believers in that area. And when she wrote to me, I said, oh my goodness, I should write here and ask if I can come and share this with you. See how God just joined the dots. And today Moini is in, in, in Brisbane and she meets this woman and I'm here and I was here many, many years ago. See how all the things are moving. And that's exactly what's happening in Ashana. God moves in mysterious ways. God gives us the opportunity to also show his great love in a most tangible way, graciously and generously. And that is the ministry of Asha today. Living graciously and living generously. Next, please. Joshi, I was telling you, and Chandan in the center, and another boy, Sumit. So, so many kids, we have eight of them, and two girls in Delhi. Both are doing their doctorate. One is Rubina. Many years ago, she stood in front of hundreds of people and said, I have a dream that one day I will be a Dr. Rubina. And she has become. She is now in her second year of doctorate. Another girl, Shazadi, in a, going, getting, starting her doctorate. Amazing, amazing things happening in the, in the community and with the children. Next, please. These are some of the shots of boys and girls getting wonderful opportunities to work in big places, in good companies, in uh, international houses. And I tell you, they are really paying it forward and helping our boys and girls in their spare time. That's what they do. Loknath was playing cricket in the slums one day. And a boy met him called, who was that? Ajay. Ajay met him. He works in Pricewater Coopers. And he said, what are you doing here? He said, ah, oh, playing cricket. He said, why, why didn't you go to the center? He said, well, what center? He said, come on, let me take you to the center. So he brings Loknathan to the center and see Loknathan's life's completely torn topsy-turvy. And today he's in Aberdeen. Oh my goodness. And he's traveling with us and he's speaking. He speaks very good. If you have a chance, talk to him. He's a good speaker. And his story is wonderful. And these children today have become our voice in the slum community. Next, please. We practice the values of the kingdom of God. It's difficult at times to share what we have deep down in our hearts because of the environment in the country. But you can practice these values and share with them and live with them. As a result, you really break the barrier. Next, please. And this is a simple example of some of our children going into the community and looking for those who do not have the opportunity or who are sick or tired or in bad conditions, even like combing the hair, doing the hair, because they can't do it. And that is wonderful. That's a beautiful way of expressing your love. Next place. And washing the feet of those community members who are way too low down in the caste system. And we do that on a regular basis. I had my first opportunity to wash the feet of a very, very poor man who came into my house for dinner. And we were a big group of people sitting and my wife surprised me. She didn't tell me. She's very wicked at times and she really pushes, pushes the buttons in my life. And she said, let's just do it. And she said, you're gonna wash the feet. I said, oh, no, God, man, how am I going to do it? You see, then you realize you're not, not actually a very humble man. You are a very proud man. You can be holy, holy, but inside you're all curled up sometimes. You're proud. I said, what am I doing? And as I sat down and washed his feet, something happened. 
I will never forget that night. I knew God had touched me and done something beautiful. I can never forget. Because when he got up and he was, in, he was walking a crutch, and, he, and I told him, you need a wheelchair, man. He looked at my eyes and said, I really need a wheelchair with a motor. And it was so beautiful when he asked for it. It was as if we had just clicked. We had become one. He had no fears. He didn't feel bad. He just, he just asked me. That was beautiful. Next place. Celebrating 35 years has been glorious. I just want to share with you this little book that we have. This is the Hope and Spice. It's a book that about the recipes of the poor. If you cook them, you'll have the smell of India right in your kitchen. It'll probably linger on for many days in your curtains. You'll have to wash them really hard. But it's worthwhile because it's brought the rich and the poor together. It also has some recipes of some, some of us in our staff, but it's just joined us together because eating is a brilliant way. Eating is a brilliant way to break barriers. And as we sit with all classes of people and eat with them, you're saying, you are no different from others. We are all equal in the kingdom of God. To live in that fashion is what God has called us. Like he said today, love. It's unconditional love. To show that kind of agape love to you, God, agape love to your neighbor is only one thing that God wants you to do. That's all. If we do that, I think we will be, God will be delighted. Jesus said, do this and you will live. So I have a chance to go through this book. And if you, want, if you want, you can buy it. And Richard will help you out. And that's our little story of Asha in a nutshell of 35 years. Thank you so much for praying for us. I never knew that you were praying for us till now. And we will continue to send us, send you all our prayer requests. Do help, uphold us and help us to do greater things for Jesus. Amen. Stay here a minute and uh, we'll join in prayer. Uh, I, I hope that thrills you just to see uh, one of the, the reasons why we, we have such a, 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 a commitment to be praying for ashes because what they're doing is, is really very much what, what we're concerned to do, to bring the good news of Jesus in a very practical way into the experience of the whole spectrum of our need. Um, our country itself is nothing like as big as Delhi. Uh, 95 slums, 750,000 people. That's their parish, as it were, and, uh, and we want to stand with them. And, and it's a thrill just to see the way in which the Lord works um, in all sorts of ways, through dreams, through COVID, through all manner of different means, and changes lives. Lovely for us to see that picture of Mahini. Uh, we've been praying for her. Um, and Jan, if you're listening in and looking in, um, you will be thrilled just to see how out in Australia uh, she's been part of that story. Uh, through COVID, she started tuning in here, learned about Asha, and was able to recognize uh, uh, this girl at the college there with Asha on her. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, we love following the Lord. Let's, let's bring the work to him in prayer. Our Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for us to have that whistle-stop tour with uh, Freddie of the work and the ministry of Asher. Uh, thank you that uh, uh, so often you, you start with just a, a small seed and one, one small burden laid on Kieran uh, just explodes over the years into something that is fulsome, and uh, fulfilling and invigorating and transforming in the lives of so many. Uh, and yet we, we recognize, living God, how in some ways it's still but a drop in the ocean and the, the vast numbers of people that there are, the vast need that there is, uh, the vast human need, the vast spiritual need. And we, we pray, Lord God, please, that you would indeed pour out your Holy Spirit 
uh, afresh upon all who are involved in the ministry of Asher, that they may know your provision for them, your undertaking for them, your ministering powerfully through them, that many, many more lives may indeed be changed, and that as one begins to experience your grace, uh, that may spill over into the lives of countless others as well. So we ask that you would uh, prosper that work. Thank you for Freddie and Kieran and uh, the commitment that they've had over the years to this ministry. All who share with them, lovely to have uh, the student here with us today as well. Pray that he would be really blessed through being here and, and know that uh, he, amongst so many others, is prayed for as the fruit of prayers, the fruit of the work of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we thank you, living God, that as uh, your Holy Spirit anointed Jesus uh, with, with power and he, he simply went around doing good, uh, would, would that be evidenced in the slums of Delhi in a way that will draw many to a knowledge of Jesus at this time? And our Father, we, we can't but think of, of the conditions in which so many live in Delhi and indeed in so many other cities without at this time also being profoundly aware of the, uh, the needs and the desperate plight of so many in the Gaza Strip and the, uh, the pain and the suffering and the anguish of so many in Israel as they, they look for the release of hostages and uh, and we, we want simply to bring that whole scenario to you, Father, please, and, and ask, we, we do not know really even what to ask for other than somehow that you would bring an end to that, bring an end to the suffering, bring an end to the hostilities, bring an end to the animosity, bring an end to the, the vitriol, and be pleased, living God, however it's done, we, we pray, please. Uh, you are able to do all things, you are able to rescue, you are able to turn things around, You've done that in and through Asher. Uh, we pray that you do that in uh, uh, the Middle East. You do it in the Ukraine. Uh, you do it in all those arenas of conflict throughout the world. God, have mercy, we pray. Uh, hear us. We pray in terms of that, that psalm that we were um, reading last night. Restore us, O oh God. Come in that restoring grace and power and use Asher and use all who seek to share in similar ministries to bring that restoring, renewing, transforming grace of heaven itself into the experience of multitudes. And we'll gladly give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great. Do have a, a chance at the end of our worship this morning to, to speak to these guys. Uh, they have a, a table at the back and uh, you can get a hold of uh, one of the, the recipe books if you want and uh, try them out for yourselves as well. Um, it's uh, a thrill to have you with us here today. Uh, before we turn ourselves to the, the Word of God again, we're going to join to sing a song that uh, really is a prayer, and we'll use that as our prayer as we turn to God's Word, that He would speak through His Word to our hearts today. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you.
seat, and we, uh, we say an amen to that. It is our desire always as we turn to the Bible that the God who authored the Bible in uh, the mystery of his own sovereign providence, that he would continue to speak through that, speak his living, life-giving, life-changing word into our hearts and into our lives. He knows you. He knows each and every one of us. That's uh, part of the wonder of the gospel. He, he knows each of us and he loves each of us. He knows what's good for us and he therefore speaks his word into our hearts. And the, the passage we're going to look at, the first uh, eight verses of Jeremiah chapter 2, um, is, is a passage that um, I suppose helps us recognize just what it is the Lord looks for in us, what he longs for in our hearts and in our lives, and how we best safeguard that. The, the picture that I showed to the children, that of the, the burning bush, it has become, as I say, the, the kind of logo of, uh, of many a church uh, that uh, helps us just say in a picture what we're about and who it is that we worship. This is the God who, who does amazing things. Uh, this God describes himself as a, a consuming fire, uh, warm, bright, full of energy, full of power. Uh, full of that warmth and full of real passion. He has a passion, uh, a passionate love for us. So that in um, some ways the most famous verse in the Bible, John chapter 3 verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What we celebrate at Christmas. That's why he did it because in his heart there is this passionate love. And it's a love, the Bible insists, that does not grow cold, that does not fade out, that does not burn itself out at all. And it's that love that he means we should enjoy uh, in our hearts and in our lives, that we, we should learn to love that God ourselves, delight in him. And therefore, there's a sense in which if you ask me, uh, which sometimes people do is say, you know, if I've got the bus in and people say, well, what are you going to preach to them on Sunday? What are you wanting to see? Um, then it's simply this. I want you to be pumped up. I want you to be fired up. And I want you to be fired up with a fire in your heart, a love for the Lord that, uh, that far from dwindling as the years go by, actually uh, increases as each year goes by. Lovely to, to uh, hear 35 years down the line. Uh, that, that commitment and that desire uh, that enabled Kieran to take that initial step 35 years ago and, and step out boldly and, uh, and think, well, maybe, maybe there is something that could be done here. 35 years down the line, that fire is, is now blazing uh, more fully, more widely, more powerfully than ever. And, and that's how God means our experience should be. And, and that really is what these verses are on about. Um, the, the first uh, 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 three verses really see God saying, Jeremiah, I, I want you to go and bring this message to the people in Jerusalem. Uh, that was his call under God to bring God's message. And the message that God has for him to say is, is really, um, you've, you've kind of lost that first love that you had for me. Uh, if you have a Bible, you might like just to keep it open. Um, don't worry if you don't. I'll, I'll give you the, the appropriate words of the text. But you'll see in verses 2 and 3, what he's talking about is um, essentially the, the issue, uh, what we'll call the issue, which uh, in a sense is the, the contrast between the initial devotion that they had as a people and the way in which that is, has moved to a drift. We'll put the next slide up and you'll see that, that pattern. The, the basic issue uh, is described for us essentially in verses two and three. Uh, I remember your, the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown as it was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest, all who devoured her were held guilty and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Now what he's pointing to there is um, essentially that, that initial enthusiasm, that initial devotion, that initial delight that the people had. And it's uh, broken up into these, these three components that uh, are identified for us here. And you may well relate to that in your own personal life. 
I think we're able to relate to that in our own national life. If you cast your mind back uh, some 1,500 years and more, uh, not in your living memory, obviously, but in terms of history, it's been the story of our nation as well. And it was certainly the story of the people of God uh, to whom Jeremiah is speaking here. Uh, initially, there had been what, certainly by contrast with where they were now, looked like devotion. It was a real devotion. And that devotion, uh, the component parts of that was, first of all, their delight in the Lord. You were, you were kind of like a bride who loved me. And, and you would follow me wherever I took you. you. You weren't worried about the conditions. You weren't worried about having a nice palace or anything like that to live in. You, you were happy just to be with me because I was the one that you, you delighted in. And, and so you followed me even through the wilderness, through a land not so. There wasn't a lot to, to, uh, to offer there, but, but you had me and, and you delighted in me. There was that delight in the Lord. And then secondly, there was that awareness of their significance uh, through uh, the Lord uh, they were holy to the Lord. They, they realized that they, were, they mattered to him. They were special to him. They'd been set apart by him. God had a purpose for their lives. He meant to use them in the world in which they lived. And they were glad to know that they were uh, not their own. They were, they were his. They belonged to him. They belonged to the God who made the world. They had that sort of significance in their lives. And they were the first fruits of his harvest. They were just the, the, the first step in what God was going to do in a way that would impact the whole world in all its vastness. And, and so they had not only did that delight in the Lord, there was their awareness of their significance through the Lord. And there was, thirdly, their security from the Lord. That's what he points to at the end of verse 3 there, where he speaks in terms of all who devoured her were held guilty, disaster overtook them. Uh, they were aware that although they, they faced situations of danger, the Lord stepped in and brought them some remarkable deliverance, rescued them, protected them, shielded them, guarded them, met them in their different needs. They were the apple of his eye. And, and they were aware that this God who made the whole world, this God who had stepped in and delivered them out of the land of Egypt and slavery, he was still active, still doing things, still working in wonderful, powerful ways. And so they were, they were devoted devoted to the Lord. That was their starting point, and, and they had drifted from that. And that happens. It happens to churches. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, the Lord, the risen Lord, writes uh, a letter to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, and that's his complaint. Revelation chapter 2 at verse 2, I know your deeds, says Jesus. I know your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and are not grown weary. And you'd think, well, yeah, that kind of, uh, just giving themselves a little pat on the back and thinking, yeah, we're not doing, but, he says, but, but, but. You kind of knew there was a but coming and there certainly was. But I hold this against you. You have lost the love that you had at first. You just kind of go through the motions. And the fire has gone. No longer are you, you quite so fired up. No longer are you quite so enthused. No longer are you quite so driven. You, you just do it in a kind of mechanical fashion. And it's not what you do that I'm after. It's you. It's the love of your heart. God loves us and he, he longs that there would be that corresponding love in our hearts. Now, that's what had happened in the land of Israel. They, they had initially had that devotion to the Lord, and now they had drifted from that. And we could well recognize a similar pattern in our own land over the course of these past uh, decades, particularly. I mean, the history of God's dealings with us in this land had been quite extraordinary, way back to the, uh, the early centuries, uh, 500s and uh, before with uh, Ninian and then Columba and, and a catalog down through the centuries of quite, quite extraordinary dealings that the Lord, the living God, has had with this particular nation, uh, bestowing on us in, in a multitude of different ways and, and 
stirring in the hearts of a nation, that love for the Lord, that delight in the Lord that has meant that, that we've sought to frame our life, all different aspects of our life, all the different institutions in our society, sought to frame them around the Word of God because we delighted in Him. We, we loved that significance, this small uh, country with a population that, that isn't even a, a quarter of the population of Delhi, uh, yet on the outskirts, the outposts of the, the continent of Europe, and yet God being pleased to use such a nation in a, a wonderfully expansive way down through the centuries, uh, that devotion, and, and now we, we've kind of drifted, drifted away from that. And, and it happens in individual lives as well. It, it may be that that's you this morning, that there's just that awareness that, that God is, is putting his finger on something in your life that, that yeah, you're, you still kind of pitch up at worship and you still maybe read the Bible, you still pray, but, but that fire, that love, that passion, that delight, that zeal, that enthusiasm is, is just no longer quite there. Now, how does that happen? And therefore, how do you guard against it? <laughs> um, glad you asked, because that's uh, what the rest of the passage that Esther read is on about. This is um, four to eight are the diagnosis. What went wrong? How did it happen? How, how does that initial enthusiasm that you have when you, you kind of your eyes are just open wide and all of a sudden it clicks and, and you see what the gospel is all about? Um, that, that moment, uh, I, I've got a, a, a very good friend, some of you, you've heard about him often enough, a guy called Bobby, who was a, an alcoholic, and, and uh, his background was, was dreadful, absolutely dreadful, um, horrific, um, almost murdered, almost became a murderer himself, and uh, all sorts of abuse that had been in his family, in his own life, uh, that he'd witnessed, that he'd experienced, uh, just a, a wretched, wretched life. And, and initially, when he came along to the, the Bible studies, um, he, he, would, he would swear at me, he would curse me because of some of the stuff that I was coming out with. And, and one day, he had his own window cleaning business at the top of the ladder one morning. It clicked. All of a sudden, he saw what it was all about. And at the top of the ladder there, cleaning the windows, he puts his hands in the air and, and sings hallelujah because he's got it. His eyes are open. And that guy is pumped up. That guy suddenly sees, this is the, the living God who has come in Jesus, come and rescued me, pulled me out of the mess that I was in, made me a new person, given me a new life, opened up for me a new future. And, and that guy, ever since then, that's 40 years plus, that he's, he's been down in Manchester, working in gangland Manchester, and being used by God in extraordinary ways down in one of the biggest estates in Manchester to see God working in the lives of, of wretched people, not quite the slums of Delhi, but uh, the gangland in Manchester is... Um, is an equally difficult place and an equally needy place and, and God moving powerfully and mightily and, and bringing about huge change in people's lives. Fired up to this day, uh, still back up in Scotland and still with that fire in his heart. Um, but how does it happen that people drift? Three reasons that are given here by uh, the Lord through Jeremiah. Verses four and five, first of all, um, they... They found fault with God's ways. Uh, you see what uh, the Lord says? This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They started questioning why God did things the way he did because it wasn't the way they had done it. It wasn't what they wanted the Lord to do. And so long since they had a track record of complaining about the way God dealt with them. I don't think that was, that's not how they would have done it. That's not what they would have wanted. That's not how they would have planned things. And therefore they, they found fault with God. They presumed that somehow they, they actually knew better than God how to run the world and how to run their lives. And they, they found fault with God for the way that he dealt with them. And that can happen in our lives when we're disappointed. Things don't turn out the way that we, we should. When we're perplexed and confused and we, we don't understand why God is allowing something to happen in our lives or in our world 
And we scratch our heads and think, you know, you've, uh, you're missing the plot here, the Lord. You've, you've lost the plot. You've, you've kind of lost control. This is, this is not the way to do things. And we presume to know better than God. And, and one of the things that the, the narrative of Scripture underlines for us again and again is that actually you, you need to read to the end of the story uh, before you, you start complaining about the Lord. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he sees the bigger picture in a way that you will never see the big picture. And so you'll find someone like Joseph, for instance, who for many, many long years, some 13 years, he has no clue what is going on. God's way of dealing with him is, is not how he'd have planned out his life at all. And he can make no sense of it at all. It seems that God is dealing unfairly with him. It seems that God is dealing uh, in, a, in a cruel way with him. Where is this God? Uh, he, can, he could quite easily have complained about God's dealings with him. But you have to read to the end of the story. God knew exactly what he was doing and putting him in place so that 13 years down the line, he was in the right place to be God individual there through whom something quite astonishing was going to be able to happen. God knew exactly what he's doing. But sometimes we complain about God because uh, we don't like the way that he does things. We don't like the way that things turn out. We complain about God's ways when those ways run counter to the ways that our society, our culture views things. And it's, it's kind of easier simply to step aside from God's ways. That's the first thing, that they, they found fault with God's ways. Um, be, be weary of doing that. I know for some of you, things can be hard. They can be sore. They can be painful. They can be perplexing. And all of that, the Bible is, is up front, says, yeah, that, that, that'll happen sometimes. You won't always understand what God is on about. You won't always agree with the way that, that he's doing things because it's not an easy path necessarily that he's asked you to follow. But trust him, he does know what he's doing. And so if you want, if you want to retain that fire in your heart, then, then ensure that you, you are reminding yourself continually that his ways are not our ways, but they are perfect. Your ways, O oh God, are perfect. He does know what he's doing, and you can trust him for that, even in the midst of the darkness, even in the midst of the difficulties, even in the midst of the pain. That's the first thing. Verse, verses six and seven. The, the second reason for that drift is found in this, that they lost sight of God's grace. They did not ask where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. In other words, what's being pointed to here is simply they, they forgot how singularly remarkably blessed they had been by God. They, they were distracted by all sorts of other things that they saw going on around them, and, and they forgot the Lord and who he is and what he'd done. And, and you'll see that in the course of what's said in verses 6 and 7, there are seven different particular blessings that they lost sight of. Let me run through them for you. Number one, he gave them freedom. He is the God who set them free from the slavery of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, they didn't do that. If it hadn't been for the living God, they'd still be slaves. They'd still be enslaved and in bondage. But God mightily, wonderfully, remarkably, miraculously delivered them out of that. I set you free. He gave them freedom. Secondly, he gave them direction. They had a clue when they got out of Egypt. They didn't know the way. There wasn't a route map. There wasn't a, a, a series of signposts that said this way to the promised land. They, they were directed by the Lord. He gave them freedom and then he gave them direction. 
He gave them protection. It was not a, an easy land. There were all sorts of difficulties, all sorts of problems, all sorts of enemies. God protected them. God shielded them. God guarded them. He gave them, thirdly, fourthly, provision. He met them in their needs. There wasn't a lot in the wilderness for them to eat. There wasn't a lot for them to drink, but God provided food for them to eat, water for them to drink. God provided wonderfully for them, miraculously for them. God gave them, fifthly, his presence. It was a lonely land. There wasn't a lot of people there. There weren't a, a lot of people around but but you had me his presence with them you have me with you even though I walk through the darkest valley I will fear no evil because you are with me I'm not alone his presence with them so uh, five things straight off freedom direction protection provision his presence and then fifthly sixthly uh, he gave them a land a land that he had promised to them, a land that was good, a land that was spacious, a land that flowed with milk and honey, a land that was abundant, and he gave them that abundance seventhly as well, and a fruitfulness. And they forgot that. They, they kind of forgot and just took that for granted. That was all miraculous. That was all generosity. That was all grace, what, uh, what Freddie was on about, living generously, living graciously, because that's how God lives. That's how God was with them. And they, they spurned that. They turned their back on that great, good, generous, kind God and chose instead to defile their land by ignoring God, ignoring God's ways, and choosing to run after all sorts of other gods. He spoke about that in verse 5. Worthless idols. The, uh, the emptiness that flows from that. Uh, and, and they defiled that land that God, at cost, had given to them. They defiled it by ignoring him and running after other gods in that sort of way. And we do the same in, in our land today. We forget the rich, rich, almost, I dare say, unique heritage that is ours in this particular land. It is an astonishing record of God's gracious, generous dealings with us again and again and again and again down through long, long centuries. A remarkable measure of the grace of God in our land and, and we just forget all about it and, and ditch that, uh, throw it down the tubes, say forget all about it and today we defile our land and make that heritage of God detestable by running after all sorts of other worthless things. Uh, we must press on. Uh, the final verse is a, a third reason why there was that drift. And, and this is why we, we kind of apply it to ourselves. How, how do you avoid that drift? How do you cultivate in your own heart that, uh, that passion, that love for the Lord? Because that, that's what I'm after, is, is to, to kind of fire you up and pump you up and say, yeah, you know, count me in. I, I want to be involved in what you're doing. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to go wherever you take me, what, whatever wilderness it may be. I, I'm, I'm up for it. I want to follow you there. I want to be involved in what you're doing. If it's the slums in Delhi, I want to be a part of that. If it's uh, the gangland in Manchester, I want to be a part of it. I want to I live my life for you, with you, and through you. I'm yours, and I don't want to see you fired up like that, and, and the fire simply growing and expanding as every day goes by. And to do that, then I, I need to encourage you to trust this God that he is wise and he is good and he knows always what he's doing. I want you to remember how gracious God is. He delivered you out of a bondage. And he did that at enormous cost to himself in sending his own beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, sending him into this world in order that he, on our behalf, as a human being, should live out that life that you and I simply cannot live, a life of matchless obedience. He did that for us. He gave that life of righteousness to us and took on himself our lack of righteousness and bore the consequences of that when he suffered that dreadful God-forsaken death upon the cross. God delivers you out of the power and the grip of sin so that you are now free to live 
as God means you to live in the power of his Holy Spirit. God brings you out of the land into a new realm, a realm that is marked by his grace, his presence, his love, his enabling power. God has done all of that in your life. Don't ever forget that, the privileges that have been given to you in Jesus Christ. And finally, verse 8, they got tired of God's rule. Uh, if you look through this verse, we don't have time, but uh, you want to follow it through in the community groups, you can do that. The material is, is there in the community group material. Uh, use that and uh, spend some time on this if you want as well. But verse 8 is a catalog of the four main spheres of leadership in the land at the time. The priests, first of all, they didn't ask, where is the Lord? They, they had lost their focus. The church had lost its focus upon the Lord. He was no longer central. He was no longer the one around whom their life was lived. Those who deal with the law did not know me. The judiciary, through whom the just, righteous rule of God is administered in the land. They they'd become careless of the Lord, just did their own thing, used their own minds, ceased to apply the Word of God as the, the guide for the administration of that justice. That's what happened in, in our land. No longer is the Word of God the, the measure by which justice is administered. And it's issuing in a, a dreadful drift in our society today. I'm time to expand on that. Thirdly, the political leaders. The leaders rebelled against me. Uh, without running too much the risk of libel defamation. Isn't that what happened in our land? There are political leaders by and large, without naming anyone in particular, they have rebelled against the Lord. They do not want to have his word, his truth, frame the way that our land is run. And the prophets prophesied by Baal, that's to say those who teach the Bible, now teach something very different. I remember a good number of years back being in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland where one of the, the leaders of the church, one of the teachers of the church stood and said, we now know better than the Bible. I, I thought the roof was going to fall in. I thought there'd be a thunderbolt. It was so exactly this. The prophets, those through whom God's message is to be brought bringing an entirely different message that panders to the self-indulgent spirit of the age and seeks to pat people on the back and encourage them in their own self-centered living. And, and what had happened here was that the people had got tired of the rule of God, God's rule ministered through the priests, through the justiciary, the, the judicial system, through the political leaders, and through the teaching of his word. They, they kind of got tired of that. They didn't want that. They didn't want God to run the show. They wanted to run the show themselves. And, and that can happen in our own lives as well. And that's, that's where drift begins to settle in. Because right at the heart of all that we are as believers is the lordship of Jesus. Jesus is Lord. That's the original creed of the church. This person, risen and alive, he is to this day, and that's who he is. He is Lord. He is king. He, he runs the show, and he runs the show of my life. And, and it is a realm where as he 
exercises that rule, our lives are straightened out, our lives are well-ordered, our lives are emboldened, our lives are empowered, our lives are used by the living God under his lordship and, and far from running from his being lord in our lives. We embrace that and are glad to follow where he leads. Um, you, you've got a, a hint uh, of, of just what a, a privilege it is, as, uh, as Freddie spoke about Kieran and, and those many years ago, 2008 was it, that, that dream that you had of this, this girl and, and what God was, was calling her to, to do and, and the living God speaking to her through that dream, prompting her to go behind Freddie's back there. Um, but, but he knew, the Lord knew, and, uh, and Kira knew what, what was going on, and, and laying hold of this girl, and, and something remarkable beginning to happen through that, that issued in, in some 4,000 students now, being enabled to, to rise up out of a slum life and have a new life. Um, that's, that's the privilege and the thrill of following Jesus, where he leads. He's, he's risen alive at work in the world, and, and he's the one who, who runs the thing and sometimes puts these, what may seem sometimes, daft ideas in our minds, lays these on our heart and says, so, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Uh, go do that. Um, there is a, a, a thrill, an adventure in following Jesus, and it's under his rule. And, and that's what, what Jeremiah is on about. That's what the Lord was on about. You've, you've lost your first love. Don't, don't lose your first love. And if that is you this morning, if you're, you're aware that you just have drifted away from that first love, there isn't that same fire, there isn't that same passion, then the Lord speaks to you and says, so, so come back. Let me, let me fire you up again. Let me pump you up again. Remember, I know what I'm doing. Trust me, my ways are perfect. My grace is sufficient, and my rule is good. May God bless his word to all our hearts. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you, you speak into our lives today as individuals, same way as you spoke through Jeremiah back then to the people. And surely you speak also into our nation's life. It grieves us to see the way and the extent and indeed, the speed with which what was once renowned worldwide as the land of the book has become so deliberately and indeed so defiantly a thoroughly secular society. And if it grieves us, how much more must it grieve your own holy, fiery heart, living God, and we, we come back to what you laid on our heart last night when we met for prayer three times over, laying this simple, clear prayer on our hearts, saying, in a sense, pray that. And so we make bold even this morning as part of our worship, Lord, to, to take those words and to use them and to bring them to you and beg of you, Lord, whatever our circumstances may be as individuals, and whatever our circumstances may be as a nation in these days, Lord, we ask, restore us. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face to shine on us again and be pleased to save us. Stir within our hearts that fire that corresponds to the fire in your heart and fire us up to live day by day for yourself and for your glory. So we offer ourselves as our worship. Use us in your service for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, as our closing praise then, let's join to sing the, the lovely hymn, Lord, who in thy perfect wisdom times and seasons dost arrange.
do, if you have the opportunity at the end, uh, do make a point of, uh, of popping over to the ASHA desk and having a chat with them. They'll be glad to uh, um, give you further information. Take your name if you want to follow more closely. And uh, wherever it is that you may now be going, whatever it is the coming week may bring, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And together, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.